I just learned that uh, whatever time Edmund went over was my time, so I might be talking fast at some point in here. Uh, this is a, a version of a presentation uh, that we've given a few times. We just updated as we go to kind of include the software releases and technology that we currently have available on .org. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll introduce John Ty here um, when we get to a, a portion of the, of the presentation that he'll be doing. There we go. Okay, so about Medsphere.org, this is our community site. Uh, it was launched back in 07 as mostly a static site where you could download the uh, initial, uh, initial releases that we put out in open source. Um, and uh, then in 2008, we invested in a more collaborative community uh, that uh, would allow for communication, interaction, project work, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> we uh, uh, spent a lot of time as Edmund mentioned, kind of, he talked a bit about the community, the customers participating in those work groups, community calls, et cetera. Those things that go on in Mitzvah.org are open to everyone. So um, that collaboration, we have folks that are both from our customer sites as well as just from the general community. I think there's, I recognize a few faces and names in here of folks that have actually been on those calls. So um, those, are, those are available to everyone. <clears throat> the site hosts uh, as it says here, wikis, blogs, discussions, files. We, uh, we also use launchpad.net as our uh, uh, open code repository and uh, bug tracking software for our open projects. Um, I was just going to do a very quick tour given the time here. So um, this is medsphere.org on a somewhat compressed screen. Um, I know it's a very busy site, but uh, what we try to do is um, give you a flavor for all of the different projects that are going on there. Down the right hand side here uh, are the, the software projects and, and uh, if you drill in here you'll see that's where probably the, the bulk of the activity is. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out because I, I, I hear about this quite frequently is there is um, this uh, open Vista in the news blog. We try to log articles that are related to Vista and I think this is probably useful if uh, community members are out there trying to talk about the successes of Vista, uh, you can you can go in. There's over 300 articles posted in there now. So if you wanted to look back at old articles uh, related to something that happened within World Vista, to Vista itself, or uh, any of the Vista derivatives, that's all there. We try to keep that as up to date as we can. Uh, I mentioned Launchpad.net, so I'll show that very quickly. Um, these are the uh, current projects that are available. Um, all of the uh, all of our main projects are available as open repositories now. So both code drops and uh, source code is available. Jump back over here. So in any case, if you're interested, you can go to .org and uh, slash tour will take you to a little page that will show you uh, kind of the different features of the site and allow you to register if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, uh, a little bit of analytics that uh, John Ty pulled together based on some server logs from the last quarter of 2009. The little green arrows represent uh, downloads of software, of any of the software, and the little houses represent uh, members of the site that uh, visited during that time period. And uh, a newer feature, which uh, I'm not sure when John released the open repository. The, uh, oh, last month. Yeah, so the Debian and the, uh, and the, the apt and the yum repositories are now logged as well. So for folks that are using our, our package repositories, there's a little box there that shows that. So that's uh, North America, I'm sorry, US, there's Europe. So we are seeing after about a year, a little over a year now, we're seeing uh, um, you know, significant uh, amounts of folks collaborating and, and we're happy to have them there and, and trying out the software. And So <clears throat> what, what software gets released? Uh, we started with the... All right. We started with the core clinicals, so Open Vista Server and CIS, which we talked about. Um, I'll talk about uh, CareView as well. Uh, and, then, and then over time, we released uh, some tools that we use from a development perspective. Uh, we were very interested in making sure that uh, we could get, gather more contributors. So um, right now, we feel you know, for folks to step into the Vista world, there's, there are some barriers to entry in terms of it's a, it's a language that might, they might be unfamiliar with. It's a language that may be hard. 
uh, to get started with or, or find uh, training, training for. And so some of our development frameworks that we try to put out there try to extend that so that others can collaborate as well. Not replace, but extend. So, um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into those technologies. Uh, and then we've also some ancillary tools, and I'll, I'll run through those very quickly. I, I want to spend some time on, on what the core stuff is. So we release as periodic tarballs, uh, and we have open code repositories for all of the major projects hosted on launchpad.net. Um, and then uh, in terms of, you know, this, is, this portion of the slide has changed over time. Uh, I think when I did it a year ago or more, we were piloting an open development process. We now, we now have, have kind of fully operationalized that, thanks actually in large part to John's work on the initial open project, which was a GTM a platform port to make sure that uh, all of the work that was necessary to uh, operationalize GTM with uh, Vista on top of it fixed errors and bugs that uh, happened because the VA ended up releasing code that might have been specific to another M platform, uh, as well as tools to you know, make sure that uh, the backups happen and you can start it and stop the server and all those things. And John's going to go through all those in, in greater detail. Um, and then uh, you know, adding projects. So uh, I know there's a few projects that, uh, I know there's a lot of projects that, that Nancy, in large part, participates in. And we thank her for that. And we try to participate where we can and help where we can. So open source licensure. Uh, Edmund talked a little bit about uh, the licensure. And um, I have a slide here that goes into a more detail. Uh, we've, you know, we started out um, really focused on the AGPL license. Uh, we felt that it was important for uh, strong copy left to be a part of the code. And we felt that uh, it would really help to try to keep the code base together and get, um, as someone over here was mentioning, I didn't see who it was, talked about the fact that you know, we've got little bits of code everywhere. The idea is we want that to all come back to the commons. So the AGPL with its copy left allows that. But we had some requests from the community in terms of some core uh, kind of foundational elements that made more sense to be LGPL, meaning that the software itself that would be modified uh, would be returned, but anything built on top of it could, could, could be licensed any way that the community chose. So we, we've, we've made some changes, and we've got some more changes coming in. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you on the next slide how that looks uh, now and in the future. The, uh, and then the other important thing to us was to make sure that we had a license that the OSI and the FSF, who are kind of the major uh, governing bodies, if you will, of open source licenses, they agree those are open source, in fact, open source licenses. So this is kind of a drill in on the stack. Um, and if you look along the gray box on the uh, left-hand side there, you'll see kind of the licensure that we've described. Uh, the one piece, and, and so this is, this, is, this is what we have right now planned. As I mentioned, the centric framework is not yet released. I was really hoping to have that available uh, today, in fact. But uh, we just couldn't get the packaging together in time. Um, and we have some uh, additional, uh, we, need, we need some FOIA releases to happen from the IHS side of the house uh, to really make that fully viable. So that's what we're waiting on from them. And they've, they've agreed to do that. So we're, uh, if the release is eminent, and the licensure would be LGPL for the framework itself. And then the functional components uh, that we were talking about would be released under the AGPL to keep those, again, together and a part of the commons. The other change that's coming here would be on the OVID side. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is uh, in coming slides. But uh, right now, that's, this is an AGPL. We're going to switch that to an LGPL so folks have a little bit more freedom about what they do on top of OVID. So community validation, um, these were some comments from uh, Fred Trotter, uh, who originally was very um, uh, local. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. Uh, Fred, uh, uh, Fred had a lot of criticisms of us, and they were, um, I think, in many ways fair. Uh, and uh, we've, we've done our best to not only assimilate kind of his feedback, but the community's feedback. And so we've, we've seen some, um, some turnaround there. The other thing that uh, was kind of interesting is Black Duck Software. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Black Duck. It's basically an intellectual property company. They, they suck up all the open source uh, repositories. And their companies can use them to make sure that they don't have uh, copied and pasted open source code in their proprietary products. But they also do studies about open source licensure and things of that nature. And so they looked at healthcare, open source healthcare projects specifically. And they said, open source Vista, meaning everyone here, everyone in the community, 
was in the top 10, and they actually called out the open distance community as being one of the most active, so we're, we're pretty happy to hear that. Okay, so getting into the products, uh, open distance server I mentioned, this is, uh, this is the, the back end server product, um, some stats on it, uh, there's the licensure, and you can see some of the download statistics, again, all available through uh, medsphere.org. Uh, latest release is substantially similar to customer sites, so I get questions on this all the time. The reason why it's substantially similar, not exactly the same, is because of the code patch leveling that has to happen. So sometimes it's a little bit ahead of where customer sites are, sometimes it's a little bit behind, but really has nothing to do with um, it necessarily having things missing. It's more to do with just the operations of patching things um, uh, from a from a, a, a actual technician side. Um, it includes our standard interface suite. So somebody mentioned lab interfaces. The thing that probably is um, that probably became apparent when Edmund was speaking was we really focus on acute care hospital facilities. And so reference labs like Quest are probably not LabCorp, probably not the type of inter we have we have some lab interfaces in here, HL7 lab interfaces. We have ordering uh, packs. There's a charge a charge capture interface. All of that's available, but they're kind of focused on that other side of the business. So. Um, I think I think I've heard about other interfaces out there for reference labs and whatnot. And I, I think there's folks here that have those in their system. So hopefully you can get your question answered on that front. Um, <clears throat> if uh, anyone wanted to take the the interfaces that are available in this uh, product, they of course could and modify them. And as long as modifications are returned to the commons, you know, we're happy to have that happen. Uh, and then I mentioned the demo date. So we used to have a, a, a better demo set in our in our Open Vista server release, but due to the way that we maintain our internal um, gold databases, uh, that that kind of disappeared. Uh, we're looking to figure out how to how to make that uh, a little bit better for folks, so that there is demo patients in the system right now. There's I think only six or seven available, and they're not they don't really have much data on them. So CIS is uh, the client software that we mentioned. We'd be focusing that on um, cross-platform deployments as well as international deployments. And vCentric would be uh, more in a uh, in across the care continuum, and it's a bit more configurable. Um, and I think I have a slide on it, but I have to unhide it. Um, so CIS has uh, has been out since 07, about 13,000 downloads um, available in an open repository. Cross-platform, so runs on Linux and on uh, Windows, and also can run on the Mac. Although if there's areas where it would need work, it's not a, it's not, wasn't one of our target platforms. Full support for uh, what we call Alley or uh, accessibility. Um, it also has internationalization, and localization uh, features, and there is some partial translations in place. Uh, it has the integrated imaging support, uh, growth charts, uh, the MedRec process, acute care MedRec process uh, directly in it. Um, and there's some uh, components that I'll, um, I'll actually walk through here just to give you a quick flavor for what it is. So um, these are some screenshots. You can see the integrated imaging piece of it. Uh, yeah, I think there's some more. If you click on an image, it expands in size. And this is some live data. No, this is all, this is all uh, fake data, completely fake data. Good question, though. Thank you for asking. Uh, so here is a growth chart. Um, this is running on Linux. Uh, you can see the vital signs uh, running behind it. There's an image expanded. Uh, this is running on Windows. Here's some internationalization support. I don't think you can see it up there, but the language, the, the menus are in French on the top and Russian on the bottom. So it supports all kinds of character sets. Simplified Chinese. Uh, the other interesting thing about the toolkit that CIS used GTK toolkit is it can switch orientations based on the language. So um, you can see here it's the buttons ordering has switched to present a language that's uh, orientated the opposite direction. In this case, uh, Arabic. Uh, so here's a here's a um, reminder resolution dialog. This is it running on a Mac. Vital entry screen. Okay. A any questions on CIS? Um, are they using the Mindstorm Magic 26 or are they using something else? It's a good question. I don't know what. You know, Chris, you know what? I can certainly get back to you on specifically what, what it supports, but a little bit, uh, I, I know I'm not sure. I'm not certain. 
I mean, it, it's using GTK, so anything the GNOME project or the GTK project supports, I mean, is, is doable. I don't know the exact technical details, but I mean, suffice to say that there are translations for a lot of languages for the base toolkit. So uh, while our apps may not be specifically translated, um, the framework to do that translation is there and, and readily available, uh, as opposed to something like CPRS, where it would be a lot more effort to do. Any questions? Um, can this front end, is that, is that something to be patched on to uh, World Vista back end? Or is it, or right, is it so the only, the only reason that CIS doesn't run on World Vista out of the box is because we've made some enhancements like the integrated imaging feature and a couple other things. Um, that it basically calls RPCs for, and on a World Vista database, those RPCs wouldn't be available, so it kind of you know blows is up. There like a patch that you That's the thing is that the patch, because Open Vista Server is released under an open source license, all that code is available. Somebody just needs to you know tweak it over and, and, and move right. it over to World Vista. Okay. Cool. So if you wanted to run CIS on World Vista, it should be doable with some programming work. Um, it's it's not because we're holding back any components. Um, from an end user standpoint, I mean, this looks a lot like CPRS. Exactly. Yep. You've hit the exact design goal. So we looked at what the VA had done, the study that Edmund mentioned uh, from the early 90s about comparing the adoptability of the CPRS interface and knowing the way that it was developed sort of hand-in-hand -hand developer and physician or clinician provider in the VA, uh, we, we modeled as much as we could against. There was even places where we had uh, developers that, you know, felt strongly in a, you know, a standard usability scenario, they would have done it a different way. But we went and looked at CPRS and said, no, this is the way they did it in CPRS. They probably did it for a reason. You know, we tried to clean up some areas, but for the most part, we, we tried to stick to the original design yeah. of CPRS. There are some places where we did make things a little more consistent or, or clean some things up, but largely those were done with consent of our clinical staff. So they would say, yeah, that, you know, could use work or whatever. But there were other things, like Ben mentioned, were like, oh, this should be a drop-down. And our clinical staff said, no, 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 that's more clicks. Don't do it that way. So, you know, it's back. So, yeah, it's in intentional that it looks a lot like CPRS. How much of CPRS would you say you have? You have half of, you know, because I've been there. There's a lot of stuff in there. Maybe not a lot of stuff that's needed. Would you say you have like half the functionality, eighty percent of functionality? Yes, is it? Uh, it is substantially the same as CPRS twenty six minus the graphing. That's kind of side graphing component that they have because we did graphing a different way. We'd already done vitals in a different way, and we'd already done growth charts in a different way. And when we looked at at least the initial release of the twenty six graphing component. Uh, we saw some some areas that we thought, um, at least in the FOIA release, we just found bugs in it. And so we didn't implement that piece of it. But it's, it's very similar to 26. In terms of functionality, you know, it, it, it runs as you would expect CPRS to run. Is your, is your uh, Uh, well, GTM. <laughs> Buscar says yes. It does, but there's still they still kind of got the same problem that we have. That there's no way of doing it during setup, correct? Or is it? Well, so I'm just the question. When you create a database, it's encrypted. So that's the way this will work on. And you can only load it at that point and do the injections. So let's not take let's not take. Uh, okay, so the Open Vista appliance, uh, basically a VMware appliance uh, that, uh, that that has all of the software loaded onto it. Um, it uh, it's a mix of licensor because it has all of those uh, different pieces that we talked about before, and, and we'll talk about in a moment. About 5,700 downloads. Uh, uh, the other nice thing that uh, we found is the the uh, VM because the VMware uh, VMDK files are compatible with VirtualBox. You can use VirtualBox if you prefer a different uh, emulator. We haven't had much call for Timu or other emulators, but uh, if there is, we certainly could try to produce them. So this is what uh, the release five of the appliance currently includes uh, in terms of version of software. Uh, for the imaging component that, that you were talking about earlier, we use Apache and WebDAV for both set getting the images and setting the images back into the repository. So that's why Apache is included. And Samba is included because there's a file share hanging off the appliance so you can download 
the client and run the client on your local machine against the appliance if you want to, or because it's a Linux appliance and CIS runs on Linux, you can run CIS directly on the appliance. Can you download this appliance? That's all kind of ready to go. Yeah, it's all there and pre-configured, yeah. yeah. So the idea is to help people evaluate without having to invest, how do I install this thing? This should yeah. it should get you started at least. On the appliance, you run it. Worthwhile. There's a CIS icon on the desktop. Just double click it. So that, speaking of, like there's the desktop. <laughs> there's CIS icon up in the corner. Okay, so OVID. So when I talked about extending the platform, uh, we're actually going to have a, a talk given by a couple of developers tomorrow, um, uh, talking about OVID and some other technology at a deeper level. Uh, but at a high level, OVID is a Java integration platform that we can use to extend uh, Vista, any Vista. Um, I, I know that uh, George's team is using it, uh, and Richards are using it for uh, uh, the CCD CCR project, and some others have used it. We'll get into that, but. Um, it uh, essentially allows us to create Java applications and it can proxy execution requests from the Java world into the M world. It can also proxy requests for file man data uh, and, in, and the opposite is true as well. So we can, uh, from M, create APIs that call out into uh, the Java world. Um, this one was released just earlier in 09, so a little bit less in terms of the downloads, uh, but we've seen pretty good pickup. Um, in terms of uh, momentum of development. So here's some of the feature sets of it. Uh, you know, the big thing for us is uh, ability to write the Java applications at the server level and have them interact with APIs that are set up uh, that extend the M uh, platform, as well as take those um, findings and create web services from them. So, uh, and that's the way that uh, George's team is using it, is extending the CCR using web services. Uh, I, one piece of it, I know he's doing some other, other uh, good work as well. Um, so as a platform, I know that Edmund mentioned uh, you know, some of the work that's gone on. Uh, we had a little company up in uh, the Silicon Valley who put together a uh, iPhone app that uh, runs on top of OpenVista. It's not an open source app, but what they did open source was the RESTful interface, the, the web services that they built um, were contributed back to the community. So. Uh, they have, they have their application running. They're trying to get at the, the workflow. They actually have a little barcoding. They can barcode from the camera of the iPhone or the iPod Touch and, and get a patient and, um, and display data. But you can see some other things that have gone on with it. I mentioned the CCR CCD Gateway Project. Uh, IHS is using it in a clinical flow sheet project. Uh, a uh, international deployment is using it as the back end for registration application. Um, and we've seen, we've seen a number of other uses for it. When we released it, we wanted there to be a, uh, a reasonable sample application so people could see how to use it, how to, how to get at the data, and how we used it. So we released a very simple patient dashboard. This is just a web base. It's built on Open Laszlo, a patient dashboard that allows you to inspect data um, uh, via, via OVID. <clears throat> and this is on the appliance as well, uh, if you wanted to. The other, the other interesting thing about the appliance is you could use it for development, uh, a development sandbox if you wanted to. Although I should mention that by now, I think the OVID version is stale. Yes, so. that's a good point. So you get you have to get a newer version of OVID. I mentioned web services with OVID, so this is a, a WSDL, um, and there is a document on .org that talks about extending your uh, whatever Java classes you create into uh, web services. So this is a, a new project that we're actually releasing at this community meeting uh, today. Um, we've been working really hard to get this package for, for people to take a look at. Uh, it's called FM Projection or FileMan Projection. George's ears, I hope, are perking up in the back there. Uh, essentially, what this, this is, if anyone's used the cache, um, FM2 cache product before, it takes FileMan data, maps it to cache objects, and then maps it to an SQL or relational uh, table. This does the same thing, but it's open source and it's agnostic to the M engine that it's running against. It uses SQLI, the package that's embedded in Vista to do the mapping. Uh, it is read-only, whereas the cache version is read-write, um, but it's only read-only because we haven't yet done the work to make it read-write. Uh, so <clears throat> um, AGPL, LGPL, uh, it's a mix of M, Java, and C. It uses MySQL's plugin 
architecture for creating a FileMan-based data storage engine. So we basically uh, use a network transport to talk to uh, MySQL, and MySQL has meta the metadata about the tables that you determine you'd like to project. George. Yes, thank you. Yes, you're right. It wasn't last year. It wasn't last year in Tempe, but that's probably what I was thinking about when I was typing this. <laughs> it hasn't been out for a year. Um, so the uh, uh, it's available currently as an open repository, and um, tomorrow uh, when we get to a couple of developers, uh, Jeff Apple and Andy Cardew, on the line remotely, they're going to go through both OBID at a more technical level as well as FM projection, and then. Uh, you know, knock on wood, we're going to try and do a live demo of FM projection and, uh, and and show you some of the capabilities of it. So I mentioned M Engine agnostic uh, implements the MySQL storage engine and it projects the data. It's not a replication of the data. So there's no there's not data being replicated across between the two. It's simply projecting the metadata about the file structures and then allows us to utilize the wonderful query engine and optimization that MySQL has done around SQL uh, to query the file man data. Um, the other nice thing is because MySQL has drivers across a lot of different um, tools and <coughs> projects and whatnot, uh, we can now access that data uh, via JDBC or ODBC, for example. So uh, we can hook up uh, standard data analytics tools, we can hook up reporting tools like uh, the open source Jasper project or business intelligence tools like uh, Pentaho, another open source project. And that's kind of the direction we're looking to go uh, with, with the project. Uh, I'm going to actually hand it over to John to talk about the GTM integration project. And I think we're, yeah, we're running out of time pretty quick. So OK, I'll try to go fast. Um, so I'm John Tai, and uh, I'm the lead developer for the OpenVista GTM integration project. Uh, the idea behind the project is to make OpenVista on GTM and Linux um, easier to install and maintain in a production environment. Um, and we strive to reuse as much of the uh, existing infrastructure both on the Vista side and the Linux side as possible. So um, project history, oh actually go back really quick. Um, last night actually I put together a new 10 minute video. Uh, we had one previously that was like how to install OpenVista using the tools from this project in about 10 minutes. Um, I put together a new video that uh, is updated for the latest version of Ubuntu and the latest version of the GTM project. So now we're using app repository, things are a little more streamlined. Um, so project history, uh, we've been using GTM internally since about 2007, uh, but without supporting tools and packaging, um, installing OpenVista on GTM and Linux was kind of a pain. Um, it would, you know, you'd have to know Linux, you'd have to know GTM, you gotta configure the global directory, set environmental variables, write scripts, do all that stuff yourself. So as a result, the uh, resulting installations weren't really um, repeatable. They were kind of one-offs. Um, they'd be a little different depending on, you know, who was doing them or whatever. Uh, we also found incompatibilities within <laughs> OpenVista. So, uh, the VA, you know, is not really using GTM that much, so there's a lot of things that are kind of like sort of supported, but then not totally. Um, so we've gone through and kind of uh, worked on that. Um, and there were also incompatibilities with our uh, deployment and development methodology. So, um, you know, we, when we deploy, for example, we typically have multiple uh, databases, uh, UCIs or namespaces, um, on a single system that we use for uh, training or whatever. Um, and it was kind of hard to do that. Uh, we also use like tied accounts to lock uh, clinical users into Vista and don't let them roam around, stuff like that. So um, for uh, in 2008, um, mid-2008, we started gathering requirements internally for a uh, integration project. Basically, what do we need to do to get this kind of operationalized and easy to use? Um, and we kicked off the project later that year. So we started the project by posting a bunch of proposals to medsphere.org, kind of soliciting feedback from the community saying, okay, um, you know, obviously you guys are using GTM, uh, you know, at, at your sites and using it for development and whatnot. So what is it that you guys do and what is it that you would like to see if there was one unified project around this as opposed to everybody kind of duplicating the effort? So we try to incorporate some of this feedback along with our own requirements into this project. Um, from day one, all of our code has been uh, published in real time uh, in bizarre repositories on launchpad.net, um, and that was actually the initial pilot project. A lot of our other projects have followed. Um, we had our initial beta release uh, of the project in May last year, and we've made releases about every month or two since then. Uh, like I said, the latest release was made um, this week, Monday, and uh, I've been putting together some documentation stuff around it. Um, project goals, so, um, 
OpenVista, GTM, Linux are you know a pure open source stack, but they're they're all kind of separate projects, so they don't necessarily work together or, or not really designed to work together. Um, so getting everything running, I think somebody mentioned here, it's like with Vista, right? You have to, you know, all the pieces there, they exist, but then, you know, you've got to go spend the time to put it all together. And there's no reason that everybody has to go spend that time. Like, one person or one group or one project should spend that time, and then everybody should just be able to, you know, install it. So um, that's kind of what we've been doing. Uh, you know, our, our goal is to do the assembly once and do it right. So um, there's a lot of benefit to us internally because of the problems I just described, but also, I think, to our customers and to the community at large. So there's three main parts of the project. Um, there's the packaging. Um, so if you lose Linux on the desktop like I do, I mean, you can sudo apt-get install pretty much anything. And it's great because it pulls in all the dependencies. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to know anything about the package. You can just install it, and it's there. And then you can try it out. And if you don't like it, you can remove it. Or you know, if you like it, that's it. Um, so the open Vista installation, in my mind, was should be just as easy. You, know, you should be able to add an app repository and just apt-get install it. Um, that also makes updates quick and painless. Uh, the second part is management utilities. So you know, once you have to, once you have it installed, it should be easy to manage. You know, you're going to need to create new instances for you know training, like I mentioned, or you need to be able to do backups or restore them, or you know, manage your disk space and things like that. And there's other scripts too. You need like boot scripts, so things need to happen when the system boots. Uh, you need to have a way to allow clinical users to log on securely, um, but then don't let them have free run of the system and things like that. So those are kind of the management utilities. Uh, the third thing, the main thing that we wanted to address was the deficiencies in OpenVista itself. So like I mentioned, um, there's, uh, or Ben mentioned, there's uh, some you know, cache-specific code or non-standard mumps code. Um, there's also like touch points within OpenVista that talk to either the mumps engine or the uh, operating system. And those are kind of like specific. And so we found that some of those things weren't really complete. Um, and so basically what we did was we went and reviewed these things one by one and made the minimal changes possible to get those fully working. Um, and uh, those, that work is all um, in the project. Um, future development, so I just threw a couple of things out here. Um, uh, maybe not the GTM project itself, but we want to package some more components in the same way uh, as we have with the OpenVista utilities. Um, OVID, Mirth would be a target, um, and OpenVista server itself would be nice to, uh, right now what you do is you install the utilities from the project and then you go download OpenVista server and kind of import it. So it'd be nice if OpenVista server were available like as a template that you could grab through a package and then you'd be able to app get install everything and then it would you know, automatically import it. Um, we could wrap more GTM functionality, so for example replication, uh, database encryption would be something that we could uh, you know, right now, GTM does it, the underlying technology is there, but, you know, none of our utilities really take advantage of it. So, for example, you might say, you know, OB instance add some instance and then, you know, dash dash with encryption or something and then boom, it'd be there. So, um, shared objects on 64-bit on would be something that, that we would look into. Um, and also deeper integration with OpenVista itself. So, developer tools, um, some things around the initial configuration I think could be nicer. And things like adding printers, where it involves like cups on the Linux side and device file on the OpenVista side, it'd be nice if there were just one command or one web-based GUI or something where you go to and it takes care of everything. You just say, you know, I want a printer. So there's there's still work to be done. Um, next slide. Um, so I put this slide in here. Uh, call for collaboration. Basically, today, like I said, um, you know, before we started this project, everybody's been kind of installing GTM on their own and doing things kind of their own way. And um, you know, GTM is very flexible. It allows you to do these things. And I appreciate that there is probably you know, some deviation that's required for everybody to get their needs met. I mean, you know, our, our large hospital appointment is probably a little bit different than you know, small doc deployment or a, um, you know, an ASP environment and things like that. Um, and, but the thing is that you know, if you unnecessarily do things your own way, I think it leads to unnecessary duplicated effort um, and incompatible packaging as well. So um, you know, the, uh, there's like the astronaut installer, which includes GTM, and then our project includes GTM. Well, because of that, you can't really install both on one system because then you have conflicting versions of GTM. So I think what we should do is kind of standardize and collaborate on the common parts. So for example, GTM is a very obvious one, but I think there's other things too. I mean, everybody's got to do backups and things like that. So I think moving forward, I would you know, want to continue collaborating with the community and try to get more collaboration around the common parts so that we can free up people to focus on kind of the higher level bits. Question? Did, did you look at the Vista standard base stuff that they 
that came out at about the same time that we were starting up the project. And the Vista Standard Pace, I think some of the things that Ignacio put in there were based on proposals that we had on .org. And there were other things where you know I basically said, I can't commit to a standard because I, ha I don't have an implementation. So I don't want to commit to something that I can't implement. And our requirements were still in flux. So I think they kind of developed together. Um, periodically, Ignacio emails me, and we kind of chat about changes to the standard um, to kind of you know converge them. So I guess it's kind of unfortunate that the timing was that you know he needed something right away. I didn't you know I didn't have anything ready to commit to, um, but I think we are working a little bit to um, kind of integrate that back. <laughs> yes, Pascar. So Pascar. So <laughs> Um, to, to some extent, I think that's true, but at the same time, it's very difficult to do some of the higher level packaging work if you really have no idea you know, where on the system it could be. So I think the standardization comes not so much from you know, some document, but if there's a de facto package. Like the, one of the things that I'm working on with Bhaskar's help will be to get these packages kind of modularized. Well, they're already modularized, but get them cleaned up so that we can push them upstream. So you'd actually, you know, it would ship with Ubuntu. Maybe not on the CD, but it would be on Ubuntu's archives or Red Hat's archives. Like they would be there already. So at that point, I mean, who cares what the document says? Like there's a GTM package in Red Hat. You yum install, you know, it's there. You know, it's available in the installer. Like at that point, you're standardized. <laughs> So what about doing the, the kids file you know, the distribution and attachments and stuff like that? I mean, do you so kind of evaluate that? There's I think that's kind of a separate topic. Um, the approach that we've taken with the GTM project is that we do the Linux integration. So there's tools to manage instances, there's things like that. But as far as Vista goes, we let the Vista tool, like I said, you know, write as little code as possible. So we let the Vista tools do their thing. So when you're talking about having an actual instance that you want to upgrade you know, the software for, you would go through the normal route, you know, do kids or whatever. Um, and there, I think there are other projects that will be enhancing that process, but we don't try to actually bundle like OpenVista itself as a package, except the what I talked about earlier was that we may have um, like the Linux source packages, where you download a package, per se, and it basically grabs all dependencies for you, like the build dependencies, but then it just leaves a tarball on your system. So I think we would do the same thing with OpenVista Server, where you would say, OK, app get installed OpenVista Server. Great, it downloads a tarball of the routines and globals, and then just puts it in like user share. So then you can say, OV import you know, OpenVista Server 1.5, and then it'll create an instance and import it for you. But the ongoing maintenance is going to be up to you. The package manager is not going to do that because the package manager doesn't have enough information, I think, to reach down into Vista and do that part for you. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm more or less trying to ask questions as opposed to suggest anything okay. one way or the other. I think the Ignacio's kids toy proposal, um, it, it's certainly one the community needs. From our perspective, we do it a different way with our implementation. We have How some internal. We have we have automation tools that we use to do that. So um, do, do and all those are installations receive like the same like, process? As much as, as possible. Much as possible. Yes. Yeah. I mean there there are cases where you have to have hot fixes, but we we try to equal that's what I mentioned earlier, right? Was we try to level out the patches. The, the standardization is, is critical uh, to, to maintainability and scalability. So um, we have some internal tools that we consider kind of our own tools that we use for managing our deployments. Uh, and we probably would go about the kids' toy packaging a bit different based on that. But that, you know, it, it's, not a, uh, it's not a negative on the kids' toy proposal. Do you keep, like, a list of all the kids' files that are being applied to your, like, do you keep, like, some sort of the system does, and the way that we release OpenVista Server now is release a new version that's like a full running database for you to start from scratch. But we also release the delta from the previous version. As so if you've built. already, yeah, as kids built. So if you've already started, then you know, and you've got data in your system that you can't, you know, just start from scratch, then you can apply those and, and move forward. So we've started to do the release in, in the dual format with the sequence. Yeah, obviously. Ball rolling for small offices. I mean, it, it sounds to me like you've got 
I mean, I, th I think everyone, I think most of the folks here would agree Vista is a good system and it's usable and there's lots of reasons to adopt it. But, you know, we, everyone, I'm sure, that's, that's trying to figure out how to make this into a business is struggling with how to, how to get customers to accept. I mean, there's larger just IT project issues associated with this sort of a, a rollout. And, you know, to the question of the small offices, to Edmund's point, it, it's, at this point it's difficult to imagine uh, at how, to make, how to scale a go up to every doctor's office kind of offering. And, and that's why I think you see a ton of these little tiny systems out there that I know you saw at, at a conference you went to. Um, so it, I, I'm, I think it's coming, but I'm not sure. Right now you have a reasonable offer if you're doing away for free. All you need to do is, is uh, develop some expertise that's available to help you solve issues. Well, you know, I right. think, you know, you also need best practice. Me, me being on the technical side, I mean, my my approach to that is kind of, you know, make the technology available for free, for one, and, you know, easy to use, easy to install, so that other, you know, smaller businesses can maybe join together and service that part of the market. Steve? Well, I want to say why. Uh, I want to say thank you. Um, I agree with Fred Trotter, and I think Teddy Roosevelt wrote something about uh, the guy in the arena that's all bloody and dirty and falling down. Um, <laughs> we have no right to criticize you, and you guys are doing it. Thank you. Uh, having said that, um, if there were a way to put together a clean sheet of small, small docs, I realize what you hold, but um, <laughs> small docs that wanted to contract with you for your services, I, the question I'd like to ask is uh, you, you say us, um, would you be willing to talk about the cost of that in terms of time, money, and expertise of what, what you have just done. And what you would have to do, if I wanted a support contract with you. Right. I think the, I think what's critical is to recall Edmund's discussion. I mean, he went really in depth into um, where our business model has moved in terms of partnering with the customers, delivering on clinical transformation and meaningful use. And that's where we see the business. That's why we don't think the software is all that important to this process. That's why we give it away. Because we feel like that is where the expertise lies. And, and, and yeah, it's likely that we would partner, as you mentioned, it's likely that we'd partner in that area. Um, so if, if we want to have discussions, it's not my area because I'm, I'm on the technical side as well, but we certainly, we certainly could have those discussions. OK. Uh, so very briefly, um, some other releases that we've done. Uh, uh, there's a widgets applicator or a widgets library that uh, CIS was built upon that was released, and also a automation uh, testing automation framework uh, that was released some time ago. Um, Strongwind is actually, I should mention, we don't use it internally uh, much any longer, but it is used. It has been picked up by Novell, and Novell is ca carrying that project now for their own internal testing. So. Um, the, uh, the other project that we talked about earlier, which I didn't really delve into in the presentation, was CareView, uh, which is uh, essentially the version of ViewCentric EHR, which is what the IHS facilities run, that runs on top of OpenVista. What we're trying to do is package a release that would include the necessary components, both the ViewCentric framework, which is uh, a, a component framework built in Delphi that can consume C Sharp, Delphi, and VB-based applications that uh, talk calm. So um, to your question about you know, what, uh, what applications could you build, you, we build C-sharp apps for it right now. And as Edmund mentioned, it's a very configurable application. So uh, you, know, you can move the, if you think of a, a notes, a box that represents clinical documentation, the notes uh, module, or a box that represents the problems list, you can move those boxes around. You can have different tabs and things that allow you to change the workflow. And it's, it's uh, exposed role-based, so if you log in as a nurse, you may see a different uh, user experience than, than a physician would, uh, than someone else would. And um, the components, I think this was your question exactly, Richard, the components themselves, for the most part, are from CPRS. So what we uh, do on the engineering side is take the, the FOIA releases from the VA, break apart the, the Delphi uh, uh, software into components, wrap them with the necessary COM APIs, and then they can plug back into the vCentric framework. With .NET, would that work your I'd have to get back down that. I'm not exactly sure. That so so the idea would be that that would be released um, sooner rather than later. We have a little a dependency on the IHS to release 
the functional components as via their FOIA process, which they haven't yet done. And so we're kind of on hold. At the same time, we have our own packaging that we need to do to make sure that it runs because we've ported RPMS, uh, some RPMS ambulatory functionality into Open Vista, and we've got to get that packaged as well. So we're trying to get that out to the community as soon as possible, but at this point, it just hasn't happened. I was really hoping for, for this meeting. Okay, I think I've more than gone over my time. Any other questions I could answer?